Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the Unlaced Podcast. Thank you so much for all your support this year. We are booming, we are growing, and it's all thanks to you. If you are new here, please give us a like and subscribe. It's how we grow. And if you've come back, I absolutely love you. As I always say, thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited for today's show. I don't know why. This is probably one of the few athletes I've been pumped for. And I don't know if it's because we have an allegiance to a school, but North Melbourne, great. The epitome of a shin boner, Jack Zebel. Thanks for coming on the show, mate. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Mate, big uh, big episode, but we we're just talking about you've got a little girl that's not sleeping well. My question was going to be to that is <laughs> how do you how do you cope with being a professional athlete with uh, limited sleep? Yeah, I'd advise to have kids post-career. <laughs> uh, no, but in saying that, uh, the early newborn stage uh, is a challenge no matter what line of work you're in, but yeah. when you're required to be at your physical best, it's probably another layer. <laughs> so I'm very lucky with my wife, Shan. She's a star. She does okay. all the heavy lifting right. uh, in footy season. Yeah. I actually sleep in the spare room and not before uh, a game. Oh, do just, you really? Uh, if it's bad, if things aren't going so well, I'll yeah. just duck off for a quick 12 hours. Yeah, you need 12 um, hours. That's a big sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But she's a star. So our little two-year-old's been a great sleeper from about oh, four or five months she slept through. And then two weeks ago, she just decided it's oh, party no. time between 12 and four. So she has a great time oh. in those hours. And when that alarm goes off at 6.30 or 7 in the morning before training, oh, after a, yeah. a night of a little bit less sleep, you've just got to grit your teeth and get through a little bit. I bet you. Is fatherhood, do you reckon, helped footy or put things into perspective on the footy field a little bit at, oh, at all? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's prioritised your life yeah. uh, and what's important and what's not. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, footy's fallen a couple of rungs down, uh, yeah. which is probably a good thing because when I was a young kid playing footy, you win or you lose or you play well or you play a poor game individually, that results that that determines the next week yeah uh, you live and that. die by that and yeah um unfortunately at the kangas we've been beaten a fair bit the last few years and you come home after a hiding uh and you go to see a little girl walk in with a smile and she treats you like you've just won by <laughs> yeah so, that's golden uh, it puts it in perspective and and um we're just very thankful that she's very healthy and having a, and a great little childhood so um i think it's been a blessing i well, love that mate well said it's, it's funny a lot of athletes always talk about it. obviously i'm the furthest thing from a dad right now. So I, I have never fully understood it, but a lot of people say the same thing, which is interesting. So um, we have something in common, actually, and it's a big part of, of why you're on this show. So shout out James Gray, absolute legend, the Gray family. Thank you very much for your support and helping getting Jackie on, but we're core for grammar boys. The grammarians, we are. Yeah, yes. we are. Yeah. So you actually, though, were a boarder, so slightly different experience to me. And I, w- I was always interested to know Tommy Bug was a boarder who was actually on the, episode, uh, on the show recently. Like how different do you think your experience was at the school versus mine? I couldn't probably be further apart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was only there for a year 11 and 12 as yeah. well. So I was only there for a short time. So uh, what years were they? 07, 08 or? O- yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I graduated in 08. So yeah. 07, 08. Yeah. We won a flag in 07, Caulfield. Uh, yep. So that I was recall a, that. I, uh, I actually, I don't know whether you're going to talk about this after, but I might touch on it now. But my first impression of APS school footy. Oh, I didn't me. know any idea what it was like. So obviously I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to be given a scholarship to go to call for grammar. Yep. My parents weren't wealthy enough, unfortunately, to afford those luxuries in my education to go to boarding school in Melbourne. And um, we were fortunate to, to have some help from the school. And going down, the big reason that I was there was to play footy. And I remember round one uh, in 2007, we played Brighton uh, on a Friday. It was Brighton's 125th school anniversary. Uh, <laughs> and they bust uh, Brighton's footy oval at the time at, at school. Um, was getting redone, so they bust us to Beach Road Oval down in, in Brighton on the on the water down there. Oh, and, it's windy um, down there, isn't oh, it? It's a shocking ground. Yeah, uh, and they uh, they bust the whole of Brighton School and about <laughs> five busloads of Caulfield as well, just down for a Friday two o'clock first game um, of APS footy, and I didn't know what to expect. So we yeah. rocked up and just started playing, and, and unfortunately we got beaten by a point with the kick after the siren. So Brighton, oh my um, God. nailed us, and it was like. You know that Tony Locker day where everyone runs onto the field after it? That's <laughs> yeah. what it was like with all the school kids going absolutely off it their brain. One. I'm just thinking, what is this place? This is chaos. <laughs> it's a religion. It was a genuine religion. And now I just look back at the, the Melbourne Grammar Scotch game. I think it was a couple of weeks ago, yeah. the APS stuff and all the chants and stuff. I, I love the atmosphere there. I had a great two years there. We had some fun. We won the flag that year, actually. That game, the one-point loss, was the only game we lost for the year. And I think that was the only game Brighton right. won. Oh, wow. For the whole year. You're so, kidding. Yeah, they got up for that and got over us, but we were fortunate enough to to win the flag that year and uh, 
we had some pretty good memories, some pretty yeah. good times. Um, I was there. playing on the um, soccer field at Melbourne Grammar. I think was it Mel- you guys won the flag at Melbourne Grammar because I remember you guys lifting the trophy and shit. Then I was just yeah, like looking at you guys. They were looking at you guys like gods because like <laughs> at school, APS footy was like god status, particularly the ones where you like he's probably going to go to the AFL. So it was like you, was you were kind of AFL. famous, yeah. But unfortunately, I was actually playing Vic Country that day, so I got back that night and I rolled in about ten o'clock to the celebrations, and everyone was obviously having a great time. So <laughs> I didn't play the last game where they awarded the the, the okay. Premiership Cup. So I missed out on the best part of the season, but we were fortunate enough to, to have some fun after that and play to be partner. Right. Because I, so I, so you, because you're originally from Wodonga, aren't you? I am, yes. Yeah. So the, the opportunity to come to Melbourne, was that footy based? Obviously I know it was a scholarship, a, a great school, but was that actually to like play at a higher level at that age? Yeah. As much so, as you could? um, this day and age, I think it changed a little bit over the last few years, but we played a Vic Country under 16s practice match at Caulfield Grammar. It was like a f- all of our Vic Country stuff. You'd always come to Melbourne because it's a central point for all the country kids mm. uh, to do their rep footy. So we were just playing a game at Caulfield Grammar and I must have played all right because I had um, Barry Rollings was the guy at uh, Caulfield Grammar. So <laughs> yeah. the bad bus on Baz come over and <laughs> introduced himself to my old man and, and said, can we just have a chat during the week or whatever? And another guy from Melbourne Grammar come over Shucks. as well and did the same thing. So... Um, <laughs> I went from just a country kid doing this to my old man thinking, holy hell, you yeah. need to go to private school. You're going to this. And <laughs> in my head, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to private school. I don't want to go to boarding school. Yeah. I've got a 15-year-old kid wants to move out of home. <laughs> so I was like, dad, I'm not going. He said, son, you're going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're 100% going. It's a good school. So I was fortunate enough to be able to choose between Melbourne and, and Caulfield. And the only reason I chose Caulfield was co-ed. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Melbourne, Man, from that was, that's freaking important, I Mate, think. Yeah, I, I was could- like- that's a great As call. a country Caulfield. kid. Caulfield, wow. All boys' schools are foreign to me, so that freaked me out a little yeah. bit. So, um, yeah, I walked down to Caulfield and didn't know. The only bloke I knew was a bloke called Jack Elkington. Um, okay. His granddad um, lived in Wodonga, and he was associated with my local footy club back home. So I met him <laughs> once before getting to school and um, driving into Caulfield Grammar. My old man had a beat-up Holden Road, uh, like a ute, <laughs> trader ute, and I was like, Dad, park this thing around the corner here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to be uh, seen driving into this. So Dad, true to his nature, parked at the front door. Oh, no. <laughs> and unloaded all my gear and then took off. And, um, yeah, we were fortunate enough to make some great mates in the boarding house. And yeah. um, we didn't associate too much with the day schoolers. I know. That's why I was a bit like culty. Uh, Morkham, it was. That, was it Morkham yeah. House? Yeah. We spend every minute of the day with your mates in the yeah. boarding house, and when you go out at the day school, it was like, oh, who are yeah. these blokes? Everyone's trying to get our food. You blokes would just always want to come and get our lunch off us. <laughs> um, but it was it was so much fun. We had the best time. Yeah, because I remember I remember when Borders left the school, like a, a year twelve, everyone was kind of upset. But Borders, it was like fuck. Like it's a big, it's like a life changing. Like you're ripping apart something that you've been in 24 seven. Yeah, well, I was there two years. Some guys go there and girls as well. Obviously, it was a boarding school. Across the road for the girls is from year seven to year 12. It's like the better part of your adulthood yeah. growing up. And, and you know what it's like in high yeah. school, you're adolescent friends. Yeah. You're, you're so tight with them. And you, you make lifelong friendships so, um, for the rest of your life in that period. So when boarding school finishes and everyone goes back to Sydney or some mm. kids are from overseas and everyone goes home, it, it's pretty sad. But yeah. it's also, it's cool to be able to go back and a couple of my really good mates now from from Caulfield and we had such a good time going through that. So it was yeah. good fun. It's um the list of Caulfield players going to the AFL now from Caulfield. It's pretty like a steam list. It is. It's Judd, started Goddard, yeah. Zeebel, um, we had David Dylan Asprey Shield, well David year, Asprey. Three-time premiership player, yeah, Dylan Shiel. Um, there's been a few, I think, lately as yeah, well. Yeah, lately, like, the, even next, like the next wave of draft, they keep showing all these clips now. Yeah, I know. Like, we've got two at our club now. Will Phillips and Blakey Drury are the two guys from Caulfield. So, oh, there you go. Yeah, they're a Makes me feel very old though. <laughs> yeah, did you graduate? And I'm like, oh wait, and they're like, oh, I was four years old then. Yeah, I'm that's like, oh. so that's ridiculous, isn't it? Oh, that and you, hurts. <laughs> that hurts. But you know, because when you're at school, obviously, I every age group they kind of knew who was AFL prospect, so it was like a big deal. So I knew who you were. I was probably year eight, year nine in your yeah, years. Yeah. So I was there. I left in year nine, but I was, like you, my parents could no way could afford it. So it was kind of a privilege for me. But I didn't realize how big footy was in APS until I went there, and I'm like. It is insane. Yeah, well, like the, yeah, that is the way that they treat the APS. Oh, mate, like, you could skip a class if it was footy based. Like the footy coach would go, do you know what I mean? That, yeah. was, that had that power. But so we, I like to do my stats on the Unlaced podcast. So I did go into Wikipedia, which don't shoot me. I just wanted to double down on Jack. But there was this line that I have to read because to me it's hilarious. It says, Zebul is originally from Wodonga, Victoria and attended Caulfield Grammar School 
as a boarding student where he dominated school football. Now, I've been on a lot of Wikipedia pages. No one's ever said they've dominated. Oh, not that. <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> have you wrote that? No, because well, that is unbelievable. That is very kind of you. Yeah, um, whoever's was, done that? Someone from Corfu has done someone that. Someone stitched so, you up there. Yeah, dominated. No, no doubt about that. That's definitely what I did not do. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh I was a bit bigger than most kids as a junior, so I yeah, was fortunate were... enough to be able to play a, a bullish brand of football. Yeah, um, but, still do. <laughs> yeah, well, I've had to change a little bit over the years, but um, yeah, the time at Caulfield, we had some bloody good players. Yeah, so I think in that premiership year, we had three or four drafted out of that team. Really, probably even long more. We had Tay Jarez, the dogs still now. Yes. so he was a year ten playing yep. in that premiership team. Yep, um, Huey Sanderlands is. Out and out star. Well, he was captain, now, he, he, he was, but I think he had a bit of time on an AFL list as well. And okay. um, who else do we have? Taylor Gilchrist went to a rookie he was spot. A good player. Yeah, up in uh, up in Sydney and played a lot of ball with um, his brother Rennie as well. Yeah. Um, and I think who else was there? There was uh, Clay Johnson. I thought was going to go close. Yeah, there was Tom quite Sunberg a f- played Tom a lot, Sunberg, of, a lot yeah. of years in the VFL as well. Um, and then we just had heaps of. Like just solid players. Yeah, it was so, a great team. Yeah, I remember I remember winning. It was like a big deal for Caulfield at the time. But at, at that time, did you know you were always going to go high in the draft? You went pick nine, obviously, in 2008, which is massive, top 10 pick. Did you have that sort of inkling in the year 12 year that you could be going that high? Oh, hindsight, yes. But at the time, no way. You're just it's praying no. you're going to get drafted. It yeah. just doesn't matter where it is or what number it is. Um. It was a little bit different back then. It wasn't as hyped up as much, and there wasn't as much media around it okay. uh, when we got drafted. But I thought I was going to get drafted. I probably only took footy seriously from about when I went to Melbourne, to be fair. Really? Yeah. As a junior, I just played because I loved it and okay. had a good time. Uh, I never thought I'd – I've always wanted to play AFL. Unfortunately, mm. I was a Collingwood supporter, so <laughs> yeah, I only went to one game a year, and that was Anzac Day every year with my old man. It was <sighs> so much fun because it was so far from home to, to watch the footy, but always wanted to play in the big stage, but mm. – I never thought I'd actually get there until I was about 16 when I made a few rep teams and thought, you know what, I'm going all right at this. So yeah. we'll have a bit of a go. And um, yeah, at, at that year 12 year, I suppose you, you get a lot of juggle with study and footy and stuff like that going on. And um, well, we, we juggled our APS commitments along with our TAC Cup commitments. We played in a grand final that year and won a flag as well, yeah. um, as well as your school commitments. So we were getting pulled pillar to post and um, – <laughs> We had a good time on the weekends as well at school, but we we managed to do okay throughout that period. I'm always interested as well when you get drafted to a club, like the kind of way they bring you in, like if they do anything special, particularly a top 10 draft pick. At North, did they sort of have any special measures to to make you feel welcomed or? Yeah, the boys were, uh, North's a great club. I I, I find, I've never really been to another club, so I can't comment that much, but (laughs) from what I've heard, it's like a big country footy club, which is perfect for me, where I come from. Golden. Um, and when I first got there, the guys, the, the original players were unreal. They like, just made you feel so welcome. Um, they made us have, uh, obviously training was very hard to start with and mm. I was the furthest thing from a fit athlete in the world. I was the opposite. Um, but one of our first Christmas parties we had was a bit of a session. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> they had this thing there, it was called Kangalotto. So it still goes today where blocks, <laughs> if you lose the, the Kangalotto, you got to shave your head. And I remember waking up, um, the next morning, uh, I was only 17 at the time, so I was oh, uh, not quite 18 yet, uh, and I woke up with no hair. Like, oh, <laughs> gee, what happened here? And what they do is they put you in like a, in your first year in with what they call a host family. So it's a family that lives in Melbourne. Right. I was a country kid, just finished school at Caulfield, so I moved in with um, the guest family, Pete and Sue. They were lovely people. I remember waking up and Sue's was such a nice lady. She's looked at me and she's just gone, what have you done? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> so the boys got me stitched up with the uh, the Kangalotto in my oh, first pretty much- Year one. Uh, yeah, year one. Pretty much first couple of weeks at the footy club. Brutal. Uh, made me feel really welcome. Um, but from that point, like it's just, you just work your butt off at training and uh, try and do the best you can. And and then when games roll around, uh, if you're fortunate enough to play and get lucky and get an opportunity, you start building trust that way as well, which I was lucky enough to do. Was it, like I assume it's a massive jump going from APS footy playing, you know, big country footy and, and tack up footy. But like how big, how big of a jump is it actually? Because we're starting to see now young kids coming to make impact straight away. But even just from a standards point of view, the physicality, the mentality, was that something you felt you were far off or did you feel AFL ready when you went in? Uh, I was probably a little way off fitness levels wise. Um, and I battled, to be fair, in my first probably two or three years at the level. I didn't really find my feet until three, four, five years in. Um, so it took a little while to get going. Um, but it, it's a big gap. It really is. And yeah. the difference, I think, between these days and, and back then is that the junior programs are so late now. Like you right. see the kids coming through, they are just – They've been training for five or six years probably. Yeah. Whereas we would, unfortunately, I used to eat pizza not before a game. I just didn't know. Yeah, like I honestly yeah. didn't know. Yeah. So I just was never taught, never told about 
professionalism or how to train hard or anything. And we'd just roll out and just kick the footy because he loves it. And really? barely do any running because <laughs> I don't like running. Who likes running? <laughs> yeah. So that was part of the mentality back then. And now it's now it's like I got a 2K, I sort of train for my 2K, time trial, all this um, stuff going on. And I remember at the back of the draft camp, I was that slow in all those things. And I just wish if I could go back in time, I would just would have trained a bit harder yeah. and learned those um, adaptations before I got uh, drafted. Because when I got drafted, I got a big shot. Did you about really? What it takes, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, big shot. So that, does that take time to like figure out or is that something like you just got to adjust to day one and just push through? Like well, a- you get chucked in the deep end a little bit. I remember my first day at the footy club, um, Danny Laidley was my our coach. Mm. So Lade's uh, – Grabbed me, was the first, I was the first round pick and just said, we've got a 3.2K time trial around Princess Park. I'd never done a time trial in my life. <laughs> so I was like, oh, 3.2K, this is a long way to go. Jesus. That's going to be hard work. And he just said, you know what, don't worry about it. Just just try your best. Go out and have fun with the boys. It'll be fine. And I said, yeah, okay, no worries. All right. So I went out and I just tried my guts out. I was honestly, couldn't really? have put in any more effort and I come second last. Oh, wow. So, and ran one of the worst times you've ever seen in your life. I remember getting back to the footy club and Lades is just beeline straight for me in the car park in front of everyone. He's just like, what the f- have we done drafting you? And I'm just oh, like, oh, really? Like that. Absolutely shit my pants. Um, and then after that, I was like, wow, I've got a long way to go. Because yeah. everyone in our team that ran that time trial, and I know it's just one running exercise, but they just motored. It makes and a big, that's so a big, it was a big deal it. back then. I don't know if it's as big a deal now, but time trials were like, if you're not running, like you won't play. Mate. Like serious time. This day and age, even now, you get more nervous for a time trial than you do playing uh, yeah, a final day of football. I feel sick thinking of the yeah, guys going to do it because I know the feel, it, the sense of relief when you've over that finish line, even if you come last, it's like yeah, it's fucking done it's now. It's done. It's done. Yeah. But it, it, I suppose it's just a measure of how hard you've been going. But uh, this day and age, there's so many different aspects you can measure that stuff with, with yeah. GPS and all the monitoring and stuff you do. Yeah. Um, I think day one when you come back for pre-season, whether you've had a big off-season of training or you've done nothing – if you do any sort of training, they'll be able to tell straight away. Yeah. When they look at you, you do your body comp and you do everything like that. Yeah. Um, they can tell straight away. So the game has evolved in my career so far, um, massively. But yeah, if I could go back in time, I would definitely would have trained harder when I was 2016. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. Hey, was, was year one the leg break? Yeah. So, because yep. this is a, speaking of uh, Danny Laidley, I think you played a game, it was round seven, and you, because you had a big impact actually when you came in from all reports, right? You, you hit the ground running, which is why I was interested to know if you felt your AFL ready. And I think you won a rising star by round seven, and I think you played 10 games year, year one, which is a great effort, but you're probably going to play all of them at that point. So, how difficult was that? A leg breaks, yeah, you know, not a, it's not a small injury no, by any well, stretch. Probably that's why I struggled in my first few years because I did start pretty well um in my first year i played 10 games and was getting a kick and doing everything that was asked of me i played mid i played forward i played back uh on a wing um so I pretty much had every position covered in 10 rounds and was going okay and i broke my leg um half of that year and missed the rest of the year um got myself back to within shape the next year and actually played the first 13 or 14 games the next year and broke my leg again oh my God. So I did it twice in two years, and the second time I did it was a lot worse than the first time, and missed a lot longer. And my is it the th- same leg? Same leg, different bone though. So the first year oh. was just a fibula, which is a small bone, and the second year I broke the tibia, which is the big bone. Um, and then this, the third year I started, I got through preseason, didn't do a heap of it because of my leg I was recovering from, and I couldn't get a kick in that third year. Really bad. And Brad Scott was our coach by that stage, and he just kept with me. He probably should have dropped me three or four times, but he just Trust saw myself and Ben Cunnington and, and Todd Goldstein were going to be the future of our midfield and mm. just said, we're battling as a team. So you guys just play. And in our heads, I was thinking, mate, I don't need to go back to the twos and get a kick here. <laughs> I, I am nowhere. But to his credit, he, he stuck with us. And the back end of that that third year, I started really believing in myself and my ability to actually play at the level and started having some impact in some games. And, yeah. and that's probably where I started to think I belong at this level. Because yeah. the first two years, I was wondering whether I was going to be built for it. Yeah. After two season-ending injuries in your first two years, you're like, Jesus, is my body handling this? Yeah. Or, or what's the go? Well, so. see, I think, I think people don't, like, particularly fans don't understand that. There's also that element of doubt for players when they come in this system. It's like, do I belong? Like, people just assume you're a top 10 draft pick, you're going to be a star. But there's a lot of mental warfare behind it, which I think that's more common. But I, I want to ask you about Harry Sheasel now because – like Dacos, Sheasel, Ashcroft, some of these guys, it looks like they just have no fear. Maybe their abilities come in a different level, but how how impressive have you, or how impressed have you been by him? And I guess in your eyes, what makes him unique? Yeah, Sheez, um, I haven't seen a first year player come in like he, him. Um, he he probably rivals Nick Dacos the way he yeah, started 100%. last year and he's carried on to his second year. But but Sheez's ability to come in and have an impact for us um, in a team that's not winning many games is is unbelievable. But mm. I think the thing that's impressed me most about Shee is, is his attitude. Um, and it's not his attitude 
about himself, like to be the best player. I know that he wants that for himself to be the best player he can be, but he also wants us to be the best team, which is yeah. where uh, he's been so impressive for my for mine is his, his mentality to, uh, when you go back to half back and uh, as a first year player, defending is probably not that high on the on the list. You're trying to get a ball, trying to establish yourself as a player, but his mindset, he wants to defend. Like yeah. he actually wants to do his job and play his role. Um, and then he wins the ball off the back of that. So people will think he just goes out there to get a kick, but he's out there to be the best teammate he can be. Um, and we've worked out pretty quickly. The ball, we're a better team with him with the ball in his hands. Yeah, so okay. He gets give it plenty to of it. Yeah. yeah. So he's been so impressive in his ability to want to help the team um, and his selfless focus for that, I think it's been a big attributing factor of why he's getting the reward himself. That makes him even more admirable to me that he's thinking that way because you'd think naturally as a first-year player, you just want to get the ball. You want to make an impact. But to think that way is pretty impressive. And people say the similar stuff about Dacos with sort of his preparation and mentality. Very unique. It is. And I remember when I first started, I was just worried about getting a game the next week. So yeah, what do I have to do to get a game next week? And you're only worried about yourself. Whereas he's instantly, I reckon it probably took him three games. He's like, yeah, all right, I've got this. I'm okay here. <laughs> so now what do I have to do to help the team win? Yeah. Whereas I probably didn't think like that until about three or four years in. Which once is- my side, once my, my spot in the team was locked away, Yeah, I was then thinking- Right, how can I help the team win after you? But now he's doing that as a first year player, and I was just like, man, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. It's incredible. It's a great pickup, obviously, for North and definitely the future of the club. And um, we can't undersell you over here, Mr. Zebel, because you've had a pretty impact on the footy club. And I know you spoke about the sort of those early years being difficult. So it'd be interesting to get your opinion of it now. But did you ever think you'd be a club captain, one club player? What are you, you're on the verge of 270 games in the AFL? Like, did you ever think that was possible coming in? Uh, was that no, so- no, that was, I remember when I first got drafted, there was guys at our footy club, um, like Michael Frito, um, Hamish McIntosh is a bit older, um, Burma Harvey and Daniel Wells um, and guys like that who just played a lot of footy at our footy club. And I remember coming in, looking at them going, they're all you know, nearly 200 game players. Imagine you could play 200 games. How good would that be? Wow. Like, that was it. Oh, that's all I wanted to do was play 200 games of AFL footy. Um, and then at my first year, the life membership, was awarded to a couple of guys. Uh, is, that, remember, is that for the 100 games? That's for our club. It's 10 years of service and you have oh, to play okay. a game in at least one of the, every, each of those years. Okay, right. So uh, to qualify for that. And I was just remember sitting there, I think it was Drew Petrie got his life membership and I was like, mate, that's all I want to do is that's become a life member in North Melbourne and play 200 games. <laughs> that was it. I was like, 10 years. If I do that in 10 years, I'll just retire the happiest man in the world. And then, I don't know, you just become so caught up in the moment each year, day to day, that you sort of like the accolades you get not that I've had many, but in terms of games played and becoming captain, like it's such an honor that I'll like I'll probably look back on and appreciate more than when you're what you're it. actually in it doing it because yeah. you you're in the trenches at the moment. You're trying to figure out what what's around the next corner. How do we solve this issue? How do we get better here? What are we doing to to, to help us improve there? Yeah. That when I retire, I'll probably sit back and go, "Geez, that was that was pretty cool." Hey, legends! Just a quick break in this episode to thank our partners, Dabble, the gambling agency where you dabble socially and gamble responsibly. Please only bet what you can and are willing to lose. Now, Dabble is one of the great platforms out there. I absolutely love using it. Very similar to Instagram, where you can follow some of the head honchos in the different sports, copy their bets, and get some good wins on the board. Now, fortunately for me, I've been working with Dabble for over a year. This year, we are doing a stream every Tuesday night. It's called Jake's Take it's from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., where you can go in the Dabble app. You can join me. We get guests on every week. We bet on the dogs. We have an absolute ball they're talking about sport and cutting up the shop around what's going around town across all codes so come on down check it out dabble socially gamble responsibly and let's get back into the episode what's the headspace now post captaincy no doubt you're obviously still involved with some of the younger guys in the leadership positions but is there maybe not an element of relief but you you enjoy it more because you can give to some of these young guys and you can actually just go out and be a bit more free absolutely yeah I i suppose firstly the time commitment's way less Really? Um, okay. Yeah. It was, you, you, I didn't realize at the time, my wife was just like, man, you are on your phone all the time. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I, thought, I actually thought I was putting it down and talking to you all the time. She's like, nah. So what, what would you be doing? Like just, just checking in with the boys? With the boys, just texting blokes or ringing blokes. Fuck. And if anything ever went wrong, you're on the phone to whoever's in trouble or whoever's needing help or um, unfortunately we've had a few coaches over the last few years. So when that stuff happens, you, you're at the forefront talking to club execs and the board members and communicating, communicating on behalf of the players, what we need to do as a club. Um, so you spend a lot of time and a lot of time is built around just building relationships with your teammates as well. Yeah. How do I help you get better? Like, what do you want to achieve and, and do that sort of stuff? So stepping away as captain, I mean, I don't not do that now, but I just don't have the formalities of how much you have yeah. to do it. You did have to do it. Um, and I suppose, 
when you're spending that much time doing all that with about your teammates, you probably neglect yourself a little bit as well. And how, how you prepare and how you can play and get your most out of yourself as an individual. Um, so selfishly, I've probably spent more time on my own game this preseason trying to, you know, I had a disappointing year personally last year, so I wanted to make sure I could get back and play footy and mm. add to the team and help us win. Yeah. Um, and that's where my, my priorities lie right now versus everyone else trying to help them perform as yeah. much. Like I'm still trying to do that, but it's just swayed a little bit, which is which has yeah. been fun. It's You're been playing fun. good footy now though. I mean, that I don't want to put the knock about 300 games. It's looking very, very – Still a few to go. Yeah, still yeah. a few to go. A lot but can happen, like, do you but feel do you feel as good as you felt? Like do you do you, do you find I mean you're thirty two, but you don't look thirty two when you play. Do yeah, you, no, I do. Do you yeah. feel different? Yeah. I actually had this summer was one of the best processes I had. I didn't miss a session. So wow. that helps, sets you up. It's there's no uh rocket science in footy. If mm. you train hard and you're durable in pre season, it's probably gonna help you in season as well. You're fit, you're yeah. firing, you're ready to go. Um and for me, unfortunately, I've had to deal with a lot of injuries over my career, and that's always trickled into the off season and recovery periods, and then that trickles into starting behind the eight ball in pre season, and then starting the season behind the eight ball and chase your tail throughout the season, and um, that's a, a cycle you sort of want to get out of pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and this year, I was fortunate enough to do that, which has helped me in the first half of this year play some decent footy. Well, I think the way you play footy as well, I think you'd be more susceptible to injuries because you're very hard at hard at the game. That's why you're so loved as well. But um, probably after the first year, even I think 2020 was the only other year where you didn't play that many games, obviously via injury, but you played a majority of games, like 95% of games you could play. We, did you put things in place to be able to be as durable as, as you have been, even though you had some pretty big injuries, you've actually played a lot of games per season. If you really look at it. Yeah. I, uh, not, not so much like he, as a footballer, you paid to play. So mm. that's your job. Um, I always just said to myself after my first two years, I remember I played, I think I played 22 games out of 44 or something like that. I was just like, from that point, I'd want to be bloody injured not to play again. Mm. Not If I've got to miss a game, yeah. I want to know that it, there's no chance of me I could have played that game. Right. So okay. there's games I've played throughout my career that I probably shouldn't have. Mm. But in saying that, I'll never put my hand up unless I know I can play. Yeah. So that was just a little thing I said to myself at the start of my career. I don't want to miss any more footy. I've missed too much in my first few years. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, got suspended a few times as well, which cost me another few games. Yeah. Um, so I was just hell bent from that point, just making sure that if you got a niggle or you're anything, you're just pushing through. You just got to just get it done and put your hand up to play and and do your job, um, I, which has helped. I I actually reckon if if you gave me a shirt front like the way you go in or your bump, I reckon I wouldn't be able to get up for a couple of days. Yeah, like when a couple of weeks yeah when yeah when well. you <laughs> when you hit, when you like when you make contact with people and obviously in fair play as well. Sometimes you've obviously been reported, but other most times you get it and you get it right. I think like that hurts more than being tackled. Like it generally some yeah. of the blokes like because we see the impact when you go like that on TV. Imagine what it's actually like on the field. Yeah, it's something it's new. part of the game that I love. To be fair, it's um, I love it's it the too. pure part of it, but yeah. it's becoming harder and harder to do. Yeah, this I know. Day and age. So <laughs> in my first few years, oh yeah, oh, to your question, I reckon you're about to ask is, do I have I had to change the way I played? Correct. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. Growing up, I was pretty physical uh, and enjoyed that part of the game, but I learned the hard way. Unfortunately, I reckon I got a, a three weeker, a four weeker, and a, th <laughs> a three weeker, and a couple of one weeker suspensions through bumping and getting it wrong by that much, getting yeah. guys in the head and whatever else that from that point I was like, I don't want to miss any more games of footy. Yeah. This, is, this is bad. So I'm just not going to do it. You're right. Just at all. Um, and you probably see that this day and age with the new sling tackle rules at the minute in the AFL is that guys are getting halfway through a tackle and they're going, oh no. Yeah. And then just place them on the ground. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah. it's it's just the way that the game evolves and changes, it does make you, you have to adapt and you've got to change with it. So Has that been hard? Because that's your, you're changing your instinct. So that must have been like, that's difficult to it do. Is. But when you get one wrong, let me tell you how long you think about that one mistake. Right. Okay. So when you put yourself in the next situation, it took me a few mistakes to get it right, to, yeah. to change that behavior. But I did it and I thought about it a long time. The next time I was in that position, I did it again and then I got punished again. Right. And the next time I did it again, I got punished again. So I've had all that time to think about it. So the next time I did it, I was like, oh, no. I was yeah. just, just hold off on that one. <laughs> and then you're there for next week. And you're like, oh, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's right. good. Yeah, yeah, you're you, playing you, again. You're still, but if the ball's there, you've made that your sole focus. And that's still the game, I believe. Yeah, I, man, that's with that's, good technique. That's why I love footy. Yeah. I mean, Byron Pickett for, uh, was loved because of his bumps. And majority of them were fair. They just, people weren't getting up. Exactly. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So that like stuff like that, I, I love. I'm a Saints fan. So I particularly remember one where you got Nick Rewalt. I think you got reported for three weeks. But what I found humorous about it is you obviously got reported. Then the next year on the AFL campaign and commercial, that clip was in it. I'm like, so which one is it? Do we do we support it or do we not? Ooh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. even just, well, just week to week, you see some of the stuff, the stuff that makes the news, the fans love it. But then the 
player gets a three thousand dollar fine. Yeah, just like yeah, it's a hit. What's going on here? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're advertising that, that that's a good thing in the game. Fans love it. It brings people, puts bums on seats. Yeah, and this poor bloke's getting, pu- <laughs> yeah. getting stung for it. So uh, it's uh, that was the only one that I am I'm actually not proud of because yeah. I've made I chose to do that on Nick and and. Um, that point in my career, I was young, trying to make an impact, and probably did it the wrong way in that in that exact passage of play. But I learned from that pretty quick that I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Fair Spent enough. Three weeks on the sidelines is not much fun. Fair enough. Now, I'd, obviously, everyone who watches the podcast knows I'm very into my AFL, um, so I know quite a lot about the game. But what I don't really have good context over is what a shin boner is and what that means. So. If you can dumb it down for me, that would be good for, and I'm sure the listeners would like to know because everyone talks about blokes like yourself, Ben Cunnington, they epitomize Glen Archer, the epitome of what a shin boner is, but I don't even know what that means. Well, if you ask, there's, we've had 1,053 players play for our club. Mm. If you ask every one of those players, we'll probably have a different opinion on what it is. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh, there is I no mean, one I want definition. the Jack Siebel, so one club player. My definition of a shin boner is somebody who does not take a backward step who's bound by loyalty for his teammates, would do anything for his mates <laughs> um, and has the club's best interests at heart Yeah, in any facet of life. Wow. Whether that's personal, family, friendship, whatever. You just want the best thing for the North Melbourne Football Club. So that's deeper than what I thought. I thought it would be like fierce at the footy. Like that's what I thought it was. Yeah, but well, it's, I think it's, that encompasses everything. So yeah, okay. it's not just a – more of our Shimono terminology stuff that we've used over the journey has been off field. Like yeah. you think about – our footy club back in 2008, the AFL tried to ship us to the Gold Coast. Yeah. And there was pretty much one guy who said, no, nah, that's not happening. So it was pretty close. It was incredibly close. Wow, I didn't like, know that. Like unbelievably close. And James Brayshaw was a president at the time and just said, no, nah, it's not happening. Good. Uh, and from one meeting at Dallas Brooks Hall, um, all everyone come together and we made that decision as a club. And yeah. from that point, we've built ourselves to a footy club this day and age. It's got no debt right now. North Melbourne Footy Club has no debt. That's incredible. It's very rare in the AFL. So we're actually one of the most financially stable footy clubs. We've got a heart in North Melbourne with elite facilities. <laughs> we've got a great coach on board, GM right now. Our president Sonia is an absolute star. Jen Water CEO. We've built this team right now that's going to lead us out of a tunnel. We've unfortunately been stuck in for a little while. Over the next few years, it's going to be very, very exciting for our fans. So it should be a, a good time to be in North Melbourne. It's good. It's, it, I think, mate, just by the draft picks and even even sort of the coaching appointments, there, there is a better feel about North for sure, which is, which is great. But just on that, because as an athlete and your mindset, you always want to have success. One thing I've admired about you is how you consistently turn up in, in times where obviously the footy club's not always doing the best. How, how have you been able to navigate to be able to do that? Because I imagine you take some of the losses personal and as a footy club, it, it doesn't feel good. No, it doesn't. It, I hate losing. And unfortunately yeah. we've lost so much over the last four or five years on the field. So <laughs> I see my role right now um, as somebody who provides a bit of direction for our teammates and our young guys, really, mm. because a lot of our guys, unfortunately, at footy club who started three years ago, have played in five wins. Yeah. But like, that's tough. Yeah. That's tough work. Yeah. So you can tell them that we're on the right direction and we're going to be okay. Yeah. But until they actually start feeling the, the, the wheels rolling, start feeling a bit of momentum shifting, mm. it's going to be hard to believe that. Yeah. So my job in the tough times is to try and keep the motivation, try and keep the direction. Um, that's why like this year with Clarko coming on board, um, Toddy Viney as well, Sonia being our president, and as I said before, Jen Watt, our foundations of the footy club are so strong. Yeah. And you can just sense that there's a movement happening. Um, we've got some elite talent in the joint for the first time in a long time, yeah. actually starting to develop as well, like Luke Davies, Uniac, and Will Phillips on the weekend against the Swans was incredible. It was the yeah. first time people actually have probably seen him play really, really good footy, yeah. um, which he's got some talent in the kid as well. So um, Jai Simpkins signed for another five years. Um, uh, guys like Nick Larkey and Cam Zerha up in the forward end, uh, Benny McKay down back. Like we're building pretty solid blocks here, and they're all really young. Yeah. So it's really exciting to have those pieces of the puzzle looking looking forward. Do you reckon it's uh, – I mean, I don't know if it's always like this with footy, but I think Collingwood's a great example where they were 17th and then you know, last year they were we kick away from a grand final. That must give confidence to other teams that is you don't have to build for like this six, seven-year period, even though some do. You can you can change quick. And I probably, I probably assume that's something that you guys are hoping you can do under – under Clarko. Oh, absolutely, mate. Especially when you've got about one or two years left, you want that to happen real yeah, quick. So. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, I don't know. There's there's something that's said to me a long time ago in my career that it's stuck with me is that you're never actually going as bad as you think you're going mm. and you're never going as well as you think you're going. Yeah. So what I get out of that is that exactly what you just said. Like things can turn so quick. If you take away everything, if 18 players of our field are all good players, they can all play footy. They're yeah. talented. Yeah. And you'll see – 
this year, last year, next year, there'll be teams that are on the 18th and the ladder that do not deserve to win will beat a top four team right. on the day. Yeah. So that just shows you that there's capability. Great. So trying to bridge that, bridge that capability and potential together consistently is hard. Yeah. Like that's, that's what everyone's trying to do. How, how hard is it for like, cause I think consistency is the hardest thing in sport individually as a collective, like for you, I mean, how, what do you think it takes to be like that? Cause you've been in really successful North sides where you've had consistent wins and stuff. What's sort of the, the metric for you or the difference to be able to do that? Is it? Oh yeah. I think it's simplicity is a big thing. Um, keeping okay. things simple. Um, complex game plans are hard work. Whereas yeah. if you have a game plan, that's just really dumbed down almost yeah. and simple for everyone to follow, then that's half the issue. But what, what I also think is a really big thing is young guys. Oh, I was young as well at some point. It's hard to be consistent. It really is. Like it's hard to be consistent when you're an old guy, <laughs> but as your age, as the median age you group grows and gets higher, yeah. the more consistent you'll be, I reckon, right. as a group. Right. So when you're 21, 22, and you, you've got 14 of your 22 or under the age of 23, it's going to be hard to be playing your best football every, every single week course. for 24 weeks yeah. and then play finals and yeah. do that in finals as well because yeah. that's what it's geared around. So if you can keep that group together and have good times and bad times and learn from the good and learn from the bad over the journey, you're going to be able to put together a 12 24, 36 month period of footy that's going to be unstoppable. Are you going to go into coaching the way you've just described that? You've, are you, is, have you got an eye on that at all? I do actually. Yeah. yeah I, I enjoy tell. coaching, but um, there, I, I've got, I've had uh, a lot of coaches on my journey and a lot of people to pick brains off. And um, that's something I've enjoyed over the journey, just seeing other people's philosophies and what they do in the game and how they, they build teams and their, 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 their ability to, Communicate with people and teach people, I suppose, is something that I'm keen on as well. Is I my experience when I played soccer and we've had some athletes on here who've spoken about like how people sometimes underestimate how big it is for a new coach to come in and what that means to the player. Because you have skill sets, you have a way of playing footy, but all of a sudden that can change as soon as a new coach walks in. Uh, you've obviously experienced that turnover quite a bit, but always managed to stay in the mainframe. Like how for you, how challenging can that be when new coaches come in or on the other, on the flip side, exciting as well for players that aren't getting opportunities. Maybe. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it depends how you look at it. Like yeah. you can look at it glass half full or, or, or half empty. Um, I've probably been the glass half full man most yeah. of my career, which is great. Um, my wife laughs because I legitimately think we'll win every week. Like I come home <laughs> and Shan's like, you, you're going to win this week? And I'm like, yeah. 100%. No matter who we're playing, we I actually believe we'll win because of the game plan we've got, the people we've got at the time and this and that and the other. And like a few years ago, we're getting beat by 100 points and Chance like, surely you knew that was coming. I was like, <laughs> really? That has surprised me. That has come from your own household. Yeah, that has, that has actually surprised me. Maybe don't print that because she'll wait me too much yeah. about that. But, um, but like, that's my point is like, my uh, attitude is that when a new coach comes on board, they're here to help us. They're, we we want to get better as a mm -hmm. footy club. Yeah. And uh, as sad as it is to see a coach, a player, um, an administrator leave our club, mm -hmm. um, we're bringing someone in with a new skill set that you might not have seen before and you might yeah. learn something new off that person. Yeah, I've had new coaches come in and change the way I play and change a position and it just opens me up to a new world and think, how good is that? Yeah. I didn't know about that beforehand. Yeah. So the way that they you know, look at the game, the way they measure things, the way they teach is all new. So for me, it's exciting. We get right. that. And I also just, just love the fact that the club's not scared to help us get better. Yeah. As hard as decisions are to – um, let someone go or move someone on or a player or something like that. It's like, this is based around us getting better. Yeah. There's no other reason for it. We're not yeah. doing it because we don't like you as a person. We're doing it because we want to get our club gotcha. back to where we want it to be, which is playing f finals. Yeah. So for me, that's how I look at it. I look at it like this is a glass half full. It's exciting. Positivity. Um, like Clark are coming on board. I was so pumped. Yeah. Like, I was like a little kid squealing around. Going, yeah, I mean, I mean, that was, you can imagine that was the first question I was going to ask. But because I do want to, I wonder, because you've had some great coaches you've worked with, like some of the biggest in the game. But when Clarko walked in the, the sort of doors, like that must have been a, a pretty big moment for all the boys. It was. It was it's so exciting. Like he's one of the great coaches of all time. He's won three flags at Hawthorne and, um, for him to want to come to our club where it all started for him as a player, uh, it's, yeah, I remember just sitting at home when the news came through and I was just like, oh, it's <laughs> yeah, 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 like yeah, success. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I said this in an interview, um, maybe a month or two ago, I reckon I was like, I had a perception of Clarko before he came in and it was like, he's always on the coach's box and he's punching a wall and yeah. he's like yeah. pretty angry. And, um, but when you, he walked into the footy club and you got to know him, he's like the complete opposite. Right. So I've never seen a man build relationships, relationships with 
not only his players or 18 year old player and a 32 year old player, the way he can build one with me and, and a first year player, mm. but the staff in the footy club as well, all the way through sponsorship and membership. He's got time for everyone. He's actually incredible. Wow. Um, and the way he's united our club to make it a family club, like as in one club, it's easy to say that we want to be one club, right. but what he's done at our club to be able to do that is, has been so impressive. Uh, I may, uh, I couldn't wait to, to ask you about it, but, uh, Probably one of the things I was keen on knowing as well, what was sort of the evident change? You don't have to break it down too much because I understand there's a season gone, but evident changes or foundational things that you felt he was looking to change to assist bringing success to North. Yeah. Um, I think probably the way it was done, it was he, a bit more focused on defense. Right. Um, and how that probably props up your offense as well. Okay. Uh, without going into too much detail, but he brought a new defensive system in that was a bit, new for all of us, which yeah. is probably why we haven't got it right straight away in the first part it of the season. Time, it does. It does. And we, we're under no illusions that the journey we're on is going to take some time. Um, but he, so his defensive system and then the way we attack as well. Um, but in saying that, that it's all new, it's, he, he keeps it very simple, which yeah. is, as I said before, is such an important part, I think, of coaching and yeah. teaching is the message has to be simple because you have to encompass an 18-year-old and a 32-year-old's mind all in one, yeah. same message, deliver it. Correct. In your own way. Yeah. Because we've all got different skill sets. Yeah. So bringing that all together as a coach is, is a challenge, but he's been able to do that um, pretty well. Um, and I think for the first, what have we done, 10 rounds so far, we've had some ups and downs, there's no doubt about that, but there's enough there for me to think that this is going to be good. Wow. Really good. Well, what was his sort of, because obviously you're a big player at the club. I imagine when a coach comes in, they want to sort of build a relationship and understand sort of how you work and operate. Uh, and obviously been such a big leader at the club. What were some of those initial conversations like with you and him? And did did he sort of put you in a position where he wanted your role to change, wanted to, you know, to play sort of more more of a focused space that maybe you hadn't done before? Was there anything like that? that yeah, no, from? no. We spoke um, – actually, last year um, with our old coach, I was – Started at half back and then went forward. And the first week I went forward, I kicked five goals. He was like, mate, just do that every week. I was like, oh. Oh, no. I didn't, I, didn't get a, I didn't get a kick for the rest of the year <laughs> down forward. So I battled hard. And then our first meeting with Clarko, Clarko just said that you need to play down back yeah. um, just with your ability to control things and help set your teammates up. It's a pretty important position for you to be able to play. Um, so I was pretty keen on that as well. And then from there, it was um, – getting myself physically right to be able to play that role and the best I can to be able to help the team. Uh, and then we, then I sort of inception the idea about handing the captaincy over as well. I think it was time. Oh, did new, you, did you, were you part yeah, of that process? Yeah. That's, so a that big, was, that's a big move. Yeah. I, I think just with the new club, new coach coming on board, it was time for just like a bit of change. Mm. And with Jaiser and Lukey coming on board, I couldn't have, I couldn't have worked out any better. They're superstars, yeah. right? They're, they're great they're players. Ripping kids too. So, oh, so really, I mean, they've worked yeah. their butts off in all the facets of their game in terms of, playing footy, but also their leadership skills. Like the last two, three years of developing as leaders has been unbelievable. So yeah. um, I was more than happy to do that. And, and I knew I had another year on my contract this year to be able to help them navigate their way through their first year with whatever they needed. If they needed my help, if they don't, that's sweet. But the boys are, are doing a great job so far. And, and that was a few conversations we had early on with Clarko. Awesome, mate. Love that. That's great insight to Clarko. He's a, he's a great man. Obviously now with Brett, Brett Ratton there, he's also from being a Saints fan. We absolutely love him. So um, these are these are some questions I want to throw at you. A little bit more instinctive answers. Um and some of them are quite fun. But first off, I mean, has the competition changed since you've come into the game? Yeah, ridiculous amounts. What What would be the sort of key things you think have changed? Oh, I was at one point the most interchange player in the AFL. Really? <laughs> By country. <laughs> Is that because of your tank? Unfit. I wasn't unfit enough. <laughs> right. I would have had 13 or 14 rotations a game. So when they brought the cap in, I had to find a way to get around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just say, even just like the rules, like the 666 rule. Yeah. We watched a few games from back in the mid 2000s and late 2010s <laughs> of just when there was, you could, if you're up by a point with 30 seconds to go, you put your whole team in the D50. Yeah. And that's just normal. I missed that. Yeah, I know. That's that was cool. That was cool. So now it's like just like a, normal that it's not like that. So like a Hail Mary in NFL. Exactly. Just like you can just you, hope for the best. Yeah. But there was just a couple of different rule changes. And each year there's something different, different yeah. rules around holding the ball and head eye contact. And I mean, it's changed a lot. Has, has it gotten quicker, the game, or is it still as quick as when you came in? Because I imagine AFL, uh, it's, it's pretty yeah, lightning speed. It is, but the rules are built to help offense as well. Like man on the mark, you can't move. Yeah, so true. So float runs past. The ball's always in motion. They want the ball in motion which means it's a t more of a turnover game than a stoppage game these days, yeah. which means it's a bit harder to play. This is kind of a, a piggyback off that question, but being under the being under the microscope is probably what you've always been used to as an AFL player. And from from like a media perspective, has that gotten greater 
for players and coaches since you came in? Because it seems like, you know, there's a lot of, like, I open up the paper, I kind of know everything about the AFL. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty crazy. It is. Uh, yeah. The, be careful what I say because the media and the, the TV rights pays our wages. Well, so yeah. That's, that's uh, part man, of the it's, industry. It's, but to be fair, the one thing I will give kudos to the media is, is the way they bring content to the game has brought so much more eyes. Oh, with the it's more interesting. aspect of it these days. But the, the detriment maybe sometimes as players is, well, you're at the forefront of that. And that's are. not always the nicest thing. It can be, but. But what you have to learn at, at a quick rate as a kid is that when you're playing well, you read all your stats and the articles about how well you're going and all that sort of stuff. And <laughs> yep. It's hard not to do that Guilty. when you're when you going Guilty. well. Uh, yeah. But when you're going bad, you don't tend to pick up the paper too quick and yeah. read how bad you're going. Yeah. So what you learn pretty quickly is the opinions that matter are generally within the four walls of your footy club yeah and the reporters and journos hate when you say that because yeah. oh the four walls yeah that that, that comment but yeah. that is legitimately the truth yeah because if, if you're my coach and all i care about is what you think yeah i literally don't care after that yeah if, if i'm getting you tell me i'm either dropped or i'm getting a game i'm trying to please you yeah. and my teammates and if i can do that then it's irrelevant what people say about me i think it dri- it'll drive you insane if you don't think that way too if you're so worried about other people's opinions. Well, you, you end up not being a very good player because yeah. your teammates won't trust you and your coach won't trust you because you're worried about what everyone else is thinking. So you just got to narrow your focus and you'll, you'll learn that in time. Some guys, it takes six months. Some guys, it takes six years. Yeah. But that's, you can't fast forward it either. Like that's just part of being a footballer. Absolutely. I reckon this next one, a few people might have even, might even say you, and this excuse can be taken as from an ability point of view, not just strength, but toughest opponent you've ever matched up against in is the game. Tough, tough. Well, I would say tough as in like they're a superstar. Like they're, yeah. they're, 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 it doesn't have to be a big yeah. game either. Just no, no, someone you find hard to match up easy. with. That's easy. Um, that's Gary Litt Jr. Oh, God, we get him a lot. Yeah, is he, uh, is he that good? Jesus. He was. Like, he's a Gold Coast Gary Ablett? Yeah. That period? Oh, and pre Gold Coast Geelong. Geelong. I wasn't really, I never really played on him one on one. We always tried to tag him, but when yeah. we tried to tag him, he used to tear us apart. He'd kick four or five goals and have 35 touches. Yeah. And have someone hanging off him. And it's whenever he gets the ball, he just doesn't waste it ever. Yeah. If he's inside 55, it's a goal. It's, um, it's interesting. So that there's a reason his teammates giving the ball every time he's in the area is because he makes stuff happen. Tommy Tommy Bug said when GWS marked him, they were happy when when they were tagging him early days, and obviously they were younger and not going so well. They were happy if he got thirty and three. That was like a win for them in the in the sort of Gold Coast days. And I'm, I'm like, that is crazy because he's getting fifty touches and forty five a week and just like taking the piss yeah. so much. But his ability to help his teammates with ball in hand is I haven't seen anyone like that yeah and then the only other one I reckon early early days was Chris Judd his breakaway speed from the stoppage was like did he ever give you props Caulfield boy like he ever give you the win nah, cut? Nah. nah just straight my first ever practice business. match um, I lined up a set of bounces it was a Friday night in the NAB Cup and I looked down across and it was Juddy and I was just like <laughs> This is it. <laughs> oh my God. That's unreal. We're here. Uh, funny, just on this question, Josh Dunkley, we had on the podcast probably over a year ago, he said his toughest matchup ever was Ben Cunnington. And I assume from like a stoppage point yeah. of view, it's a bit more technical, Josh's sort of point of view on it. But just on like Ben Cunnington, like to me, from the outside, he epitomizes a shin boner for me and all he's been through and the way he goes about it. Like, how special was it for you to play with a bloke like that? Yeah, well, he got drafted the year after me and we've spent a long time in a center square with Goldie together. Yeah. Um, it's funny because you got to probably uh, um, what you think of Ben Cunnington in your head right now. He <laughs> eats concrete and drinks cans all <laughs> yeah. day. Yeah. But like off the field, you couldn't meet a nicer bloke. Really? Like just just a beautiful human being. And he's got three beautiful kids and his wife, Belinda. He doesn't talk. She does all the talking. It's yeah. it's it's honestly unreal. And then he goes across the white line and he's an animal. Yeah. And yeah. you just love playing. Some blokes are just like, like that. Hey, yeah. they're just like sport brings you a different animal. Yeah. I and mean, he has to be as well. Yeah. You can't be a nice guy out there. Otherwise, you're going to get nowhere. So he's one of my favorite teammates to play with. Um, he loves a physical contact. He loves a contest. Um, we used to joke for a big period of our time is he average about 80% contested possession rate. He's like, couldn't get an easy touch. Wow. Even when he got an easy touch, he'd like fumble it. So it gets off the ground as a contested possession. <laughs> <laughs> That's golden. So wouldn't ruin his, uh, his stats, but he's, uh, yeah, he's one of my favorite teammates. I, I admired him because it, it seemed like his toughness and what he did on the footy field. He never did it for any limelight as well. Like he seemed like a pretty sheltered reserve guy off it, which you don't really get that in the modern day as much because there's so much, but he just kind of kept to himself. He the, refuses media. Yeah, which I think is And help awesome. outside of that. All he wants to do in any spare time he's got, he's got a farm down in Warrnambool with about <laughs> 130 Black Angus cattle on it. <laughs> he just goes and tends to and gets them sorted. Oh, this, this will be a tough one for you. Best player you've ever played with. You played with, with some greats. Yeah. I know we just spoke of Ben Cunnington, but you played with some from the start of your career to the end. Oh, probably the one that really sticks out is Boomer. Boomer, yeah. Yeah. He for like his stature and like he's short and small, but generally short and small guys have limitations. Mm. But he just never let that get in the way of him. Like he would have impact. Like he played four hundred 
32 games, whatever See, it is. See, the highest game. Yeah, is that, record holder. Your record holder, yeah. And I reckon he got tagged for 400 of them. Wow. And he still had it 30 times and kicked two goals each week. Like, it was just, yeah. I don't was know, playing with him, he was just, he's just so driven and so professional to last all those years. Yeah. He was, he was awesome. Was his mentality on a different level? Because I feel like at that height, even though his super, like, skill set was superior, which showed, but there has to be a mentality there is, to be 100%. able to, to do what he did. Yeah, I think so. He he was out to be the best player he could be and help his team the way he knew best, and that was to get the ball and help his mates because he never wasted it either. Yeah, and he would just use his skill set better yeah. than anyone could try and stop it. <laughs> so like it was, yeah, his mindset and mentality set the bar for a long time at North Melbourne. Uh, that's really, good. and he's Weird. still there now. Does a development well, coach? I've helping seen him doing push ups, so. like push up comes to people Mate, still, and I'm like, he's Riggy's in now. He's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> he can still play. <laughs> uh, shout out, Boomer. That's golden. In, in your career, who at what points? This could be a different season or whatever. But hardest team you hardest team you ever played? Like who in what era was yeah. just impossible? Uh, yeah, I think. He's been some great teams. You got the Hawthorne tri- triple flag. You got the Richmond triple flag. I reckon. I honestly think Geelong early. Oh yeah, 2010, everyone speaks. 11. Dane Swan's massive advocate of yeah. like Geelong. It was like war. Yeah, that that and down there we'd always get them down there, and they'd always smack us. Oh, always, really? it's such a shit place to play for you. Yeah. <laughs> so hard. Yeah, um, they play the ground so skinny. They play it so well. So yeah, that that would be the number one. Oh, I think. Good. And then, do you have a welcome to the AFL moment? One where you're like, holy shit, this thing is bigger and better than what I assumed. No, I just vividly remember my first year, um, the Chris Judd thing I spoke about just then. Oh yeah. But then there was another one with this is so random. Uh Daniel Cross used to play at the Bulldogs and Melbourne. Good player. Yeah, he's now our rehab coach. Coach. <laughs> and I was talking about this the other day. I remember playing the Bulldogs in round two in my first year. So this is my second game. And I line up on the wing against Crossy and I look down and he has the biggest calves. <laughs> ever. <Really? laughs> I remember looking at him just going, Whoa, this bloke can run. <laughs> no word of a lie. We had 40 times just running up and down all day. I was like, I've got a long way to go here. Out of all the yeah, things yeah, you I think know, of, you've looked at the bloke's so car. That just stood out in my head. So I told him the other day and I was just like, That's like Johnny Drama says that in Entourage. He gets obsessed with the bloke's calves. That's what that just reminded me of. But not level me like Johnny Drama. Uh, <laughs> no, not at all. Well, final question because this is some, a sort of tradition, traditional question which the listeners will know on our podcast. We attest sort of three key traits to success in business or sport. All three are obviously very important, but just want to get the one that sort of resonates the most with you and your journey. And that's out of resilience, drive or ambition. Which one was sort of really pivotal to help you be sort of this one club player, 270 games, club captain? Resilience for me. Yeah. I think you've got to uh, you've got to have some tough times to enjoy the good times. And if you don't have one or the other, yeah. um, you, or if you don't have the resilience, you won't be able to enjoy th- – the good times to the full extent. Yeah. Um, the bad days make the good days even better. Yeah. Two leg breaks. You come back. From Early that. days. Yeah. And then even now, like I just picture this four or five year period, as I spoke about before with our young guys who have played in three, four wins. Mm. When we become a good team and we win every week, these boys are going to enjoy it so much more because so, they've been a shit team. Yeah. And they've been beaten a lot. So that when they become good, they're going to value that a lot more than to say somebody who walks into a good team and knows no different. So okay. the lessons you'll learn – in hard times, probably shape you as a person, I reckon. Well said. Well, Jack Zebel, you're a superstar, mate. Pleasure having you on the podcast. Caulfield boy, of course, mate. So I can't thank you enough. Thanks for having me. It's been uh, good fun. Awesome. 